mix it up a little bit, so I'll be uh, first before Kat comes up. Hey, just really want to say, um, uh, this is actually a real privilege for us to come. We've left uh, our three young kids at home, um, and it's a, it's a beautiful opportunity to kind of um, have a bit of a break after the school holidays, um, but also to, to be with you guys. Uh, we've, we've seen some of you guys um, at, around our side of the ditch, um, and, um, and some of you have faithfully come over every year, um, and just really want to uh, thank you guys who have, who have built those relationships, um, and it's amazing to kind of come here and be with you guys tonight. So, nearly 15 years ago, uh, I joined a small community of Christians living in an old mattress factory in the inner city of Wellington. That era was incredibly formative for me, not just because I was in my early 20s at the time, but this, because this is where I really came to learn what living in community really consists of. Uh, at the time, there were about 10 people uh, living in this old um, three-story building uh, with one flat just over the fence. And the building was lovingly called the castle, and it might as well have been built um, in some kind of past era. When the community first moved into the building, it had been used as a drug dive. Uh, the sinks were filled with vomit, and it took multiple skips uh, to clear all the rubbish out of the building. It was made of concrete, and because of all the cracks in the walls and the roof, uh, every time it rained, it leaked and literally poured through the building. We lived next door to a fish market and a cafe, and so we would get woken up every morning uh, to the early sounds of the city coming to life. And our building was located on Upper Cuba Street. Uh, this is in the kind of inner city of, of Wellington. And the castle in the neighbouring flat opened out to that part of town uh, where sex workers, streeties and alkies would congregate. And so the bottom floor of our building in the castle, we hosted drop-in meals uh, in a church service each week for the local street community. And the understanding was that everyone came, would come and participate, which made for some very colourful sharing uh, and communion with often dumpster-dived bread. But this was their church, and it reflected their life. We also sought not just to provide charity to these, but to enter into relationship with the street community. So Kat uh, befriended many of the local sex workers, uh, and in turn became a surrogate mum to one of their kids for some eight years. I sat and talked um, with the streeties as they passed each day, doing the same routine of cask wine, glue sniffing, and getting moved around the city by security or police. And we would often take this uh, colourful gathering of diverse difference away on camps with us, which was always a challenge to everyone's mental health, uh, but especially those who are prone to panic attacks, um, or who had a tendency to go off wandering. Alongside our relationships uh, to the street community, we were activists. Protests, vigils and community actions were all part of our regular life, for some more so than others. We drank deeply from the wells of liberation theology, Brueggemann, Wink, Elol, Day. It was an exciting time for a budding young theologian. This community uh, called Stillwaters was part of a wider network of other communities called Urban Vision. It was fairly small at the time, with one community fostering teenagers, another connecting primarily with Somali refugees and council housing, and a new rural community had started up called Natiawa. We were like an extended family to each other, and for many of us, this community took the place of our genetic families. So a couple of years after I joined, a major division uh, threatened to split the Urban Vision Network, and it was partly over whether we were a network or something else. Like many emerging intentional communities, we were constantly deconstructing and reconstructing our identity, both at a personal and collective level. We had so few comparable examples of other communities on which to model ourselves, and so we often pitted one model of community against the, another, trying to kind of glean the strengths and weaknesses of each, but in the process setting up polarizations, often built on shades of difference. Eventually, one cohort 
of the urban vision, largely the founding generation, wanted to go in a direction of more structure and order. They grew tired of being in a perpetual state of identity crisis and wanted to firm up our charism or DNA. They also saw the damaging effects of our critical view of leadership as it meant little support and accountability when things went wrong. Alongside this was a desire for more accountability and recognition from the wider church, which until then found it difficult to know how to relate to us. Others, however, wanted to either keep things the way they were or to go in a direction of less order and embrace a more anarchic ethos. This cohort wanted to retain the particularity of each community and resist the urge to homogenize. Unlike the founding generation, this generation sought to individuate while remaining relationally connected. Some of them were also critical of attempts to validate our identity by gaining more recognition from the wider church. It wasn't long before these two positions hardened into two opposing ideologies. Tragically, the community did split, and a number of our members went their separate ways. People were left hurt, misunderstood, and angry. The final event where all this culminated uh, was at Kat and my wedding, uh, where members of the community, of which we had been part for years, could not bring themselves to celebrate with us. The final farewell of our home community of Stillwaters happened without our knowing while we were away on honeymoon. We were left hurt, confused and angry. Now all this happened some 10 years ago and most of the relationships have been mended since then. Kat and I remained part of Urban Vision and we have had some beautiful chapters in other communities since then. I mentioned this early story not just because it illustrates some of the real life dynamics of what happens in intentional community, but because it taught me that community is only as strong as the relationships within it. Underneath all the ideological framing of the issues that divided our community, there was a breakdown in relationship. People became less trusting of each other and began to doubt the foundations on which our relationships were based. Without a culture of trust, the gap between people's interpretation of the same experience and history ends up growing. Each new encounter, as we tried to kind of reconcile, tended to further reinforce the narrative that people had constructed of the other person's intentions and their view of themselves. Their resulting experience of leaving hurt and misunderstood confirmed their feeling that they were in fact the victims all along. When the romanticised and idealised conceptions of community are stripped away, we realise, don't we, that living in community is actually really hard work. I suspect that the weakening of communal bonds in modern life is in part an attempt to insulate us from the pain and suffering, but also the joy of genuinely encountering the other as well as our sense of self in relation to others. No doubt we all have stories where those closest to us have the capacity to hurt us in the most profound ways, but also to reveal to us what we are really like up close. I don't intend to unpack or provide a solution to community breakups or why people leave, except to point out that without a healthy understanding of conflict and an equally strong commitment to relationships within community, our desire for community will always be frustrated, regardless of how passionate we may be about its ideals. So tonight, I want to share with you how my early experience of Christian community led me on a faith theological journey to find fresh ways of illuminating the life to which Jesus has called us which I believe directs us to foster the kinds of relationships and communities where conflict and people's differences need not threaten the community's existence. This journey has taken me towards restorative justice. And so I want to share with you what I think this restorative lens has to contribute to the task of Christian community living today. 
Restorative justice was birthed, as Mennonite theologian Tom Newfeld puts it, within the womb of a biblically informed piety and ethics. It emerged in the attempt to answer a biblically informed and urged set of questions. How can persons committed to peace, reconciliation and restoration inject that set of convictions and reflexes into the public arena of responses to crime? Given the prevalence of restorative responses to conflict in wider society today, it is easy to forget that this approach first took shape as small groups of Mennonite believers gathered to discern how the church ought to respond to incidents of wrongdoing in light of the witness of scripture and their own peacemaking practices. On the 28th of May, 1974, after two intoxicated teenagers went on a vandalism spree in a small town of Almira, Ontario, a small group of Mennonites held a meeting. They were frustrated by the usual punishment paradigm and they proposed that these two young people should knock on each of the 22 doors of the owners of the houses and businesses that they had vandalised and find out who they were, how they had been affected and what they can do to put things right. One of those present, Mark Yancey, was a probation officer who was charged by the Mennonite Central Committee to find community oriented alternatives to punishment. Mennonites like Yancey had begun to move away from their separatist two kingdoms theology and were instead seeking to provide a Christian witness to the state based on the alternative politics of Jesus. Early drafts of John Howard Yoder's The Politics of Jesus were appearing at this time as a resource for the new generation of Mennonites seeking a biblically informed model of radical political action. One unique feature that emerged as a result of this initiative was the emphasis given to peacemaking and reconciliation within a field that held to a largely retributive notion of justice. The stated goal of these early experiments was to pursue justice in a way that brings peace to all those affected by the harm. Before Howard Zayer had popularised the distinction between a purely retributive and restorative understanding of justice, these practitioners were intuitively drawing on their faith tradition, which refused to hold apart the goals of justice and peace, judgement and mercy, fairness and compassion. It is important to grasp that the early pioneers of restorative justice did not intend to set up just another program for intervening in crime. Rather, they saw restorative justice as a way of understanding and living out the mission of the church, which is to be ministers of reconciliation and agents of God's shalom. Their hope was that the church would exemplify in its life together and in the giving of its life to the world a way of dealing with harm and conflict that transcends retributive logic by enacting the healing and restorative justice made possible by Jesus. While they welcomed the mainstreaming of restorative alternatives in public discourse, it was clear to advocates like Zaya that in order to resist the pressures of diversion and subversion, restorative justice must be grounded in an alternative community of practice. Zaya was heavily influenced by John Yoder in this regard, who argued that the revolution brought about by Jesus was the creation of a distinct community with its own deviant set of values and its coherent way of incarnating them. In other words, Jesus called into existence a new society, a new expression of humanity, one which derives its existence not from the old aeon where rulers and subversive struggle violently over who will control the path of history, but rather from the new aeon where God's future kingdom is breaking into the present. Restorative justice was viewed as a realisation of a new way of relating to one another, a new way of being in the world, which arises from the vision of what human community ought to look like in light of the original revolution. The hope for social change manifest in the restorative vision of justice rests to a significant degree on faith that the Spirit of God is continuing to bring into being a human community patterned on Jesus as the justice of God. While the reception 
of a restorative conception of justice has been well received by those seeking to advocate for an alternative justice system in the public arena, I think it would be fair to say that the same receptivity has not been present within the church. The rapid ascendancy of restorative justice in mainstream public discourse has been accompanied by a notable lack of any continued theological engagement with it in the church, with perhaps members of this AAANZ network being the exception. We now have restorative prisons, restorative schools, and even restorative cities. We're starting to see restorative universities, workplaces, and social work agencies being modeled after restorative practices and principles. And yet, the very community which gave birth to the restorative vision of justice has yet to fully develop what it would mean to be a restorative church. This is unfortunate, as I believe that the idea of a restorative church provides a fruitful way of thinking about the communal and missional life of the church, and particularly for communities seeking a more intentional life together. So what might this look like? Well, I just want to suggest three things before I pass over to Kat. The first one is biblical. Justice is one of the big themes of scripture, linking together a number of other related concepts like mercy, peace, salvation, and reconciliation. How we understand justice, therefore, will significantly shape our understanding of the biblical narrative the nature and purposes of God, and our place in that story. One of the things that restorative justice has alerted us to is that there are competing notions of justice, both in wider society and in the church. The history of biblical interpretation has too often favoured a retributive conception of justice, with devastating consequences for the church and its witness. By interpreting justice in purely retributive terms, churches are more likely to endorse a view of God that is authoritarian, punitive, and whose relationship to humanity is conditional and somewhat removed. They are more likely to accept punishment as the normal recourse for dealing with wrongdoing and even view it as a moral good. And while not doing away with God's other attributes like love or mercy, these tend to be relegated to a secondary status. Love is expressed as doing what justice requires, while works of mercy effectively do the cleaning up after justice has been satisfied. The church's understanding of justice has not only been distorted, it has been fragmented. Some churches emphasize the socioeconomic ramifications of justice by speaking about social justice, with the result that distributive conceptions are at the forefront. Others emphasize the spiritual dimensions of justice by speaking about God's righteousness justifying the ungodly, with the result that individualized and spiritualized conceptions are dominant. Still others emphasize justice as therapy, where inclusion and acceptance are viewed as self-sufficient goods for a just society. While not a panacea, I have found that the restorative understanding of justice as active in the writing of relationships through acts of healing, deliverance, and forgiveness to offer a more coherent and biblical reading of justice-related texts in scripture. It also enables a church a place in the story as it embodies the central concern of scripture, God's restoration of the world through a creation of a new people effective through practices of forgiveness, liberation, and healing. This trains us to see Jesus as God's agent of restoration, bringing us into his restored kingdom. When Paul declares that Jesus, to the Romans that Jesus is the justice of God, he shifts the meaning of justice away from being a mere attribute and casts it as an event that is disclosed through the particular story of Jesus. Justice thereby becomes a saving or a liberating event in the sense of being freed from captivity as well as being brought into a life-giving state. Jesus' story gives direction to the meaning of justice, moving away from enslavement to the age of sin and death and towards the eschatological age of resurrection life. Wherever the church participates in this work of justice-making, whether in the context of liberating captives, 
providing for the needs of the poor and oppressed, or offering sanctuary to those ravaged by war or political instability, they are enacting the justice by which God is made known in Jesus. Justice is, above all, a relational concept. Jesus is the justice of God because he restores our relationship to God. It is the same justice that is to be exemplified in our relationships with each other, which leads to my second suggestion, which is a practical one. Restorative justice offers not only a better reading of scripture, it also offers a set of practices and a distinct approach for dealing with conflict or having difficult conversations. Christian communities, whether they be congregations or the live-in variety, constantly face situations of conflict, which can quickly leave people feeling hurt, resentful, or to become deeply divided over their differences or disagreements. While the presence of conflict in the church community ought not surprise us, the inability to deal with it constructively is alarming and deeply detrimental to its witness. Restorative justice began, as I said, as an approach to crime. When wrongdoing is present within the church, restorative justice provides a way of putting right the wrongs by holding together a concern for both the offender and those harmed by their actions. Instead of being forced to take sides, a mutuality of care can be offered to all as an expression of this church's solidarity with offenders and victims alike. It also provides a role for the community as a whole to become a source of comfort and healing in addressing the ripples of harm, which may well involve introducing systems of ongoing support and accountability. Church conflicts, however, are more often than not two-sided, where both sides feel disrespected, mistreated, or misunderstood by the other party. What is perhaps most needed in such situations is for respectful conversation, where listening and mutual understanding can develop without the fear of being judged or blamed. The presence of a third party facilitator can be extremely helpful here. And while restorative processes do not require highly trained experts, following such simple steps can be helpful. First, take time. Don't be in a rush to solve what might appear to be a trivial problem. Get the full story out. And make sure you hear everyone's side of the story. Second, go below the surface. Don't be afraid to explore what thoughts or feelings are lingering. Ask what still needs to be acknowledged. Talk it out and listen carefully. Allow space for what needs to be said to one another. Check in whether there is a, mutu whether there is a mutual understanding, especially around the harm that has been experienced. Clarify next steps. How can things be put right and who's going to do what? What can be done so this doesn't happen again? And finally, what has been learnt? If conflict is to be transformative, we need to learn from it by reflecting on it. This might involve changes in attitude or worldview or a changed course in direction. This kind of simple process, though, often gets short-circuited. The story becomes one-sided or is interrupted before it all gets told. People's emotions get ignored or they don't feel safe in sharing them. The elephant in the room never gets acknowledged. People don't speak for themselves, but instead diagnose everyone else's problems. Listening gets drowned out by all the speaking. Nothing changes. While the issue, conflict, or conversation might be difficult, our way of handling it need not be so. This process is as simple as it is effective. It can range from a conversation through a facil to a facilitated multi-party conference, but the same basic principles apply. For this reason, it has been used not just for solving, resolving conflict, but for general meetings, check-in conversations, and community building exercises. Restorative processes work best when those most affected are enabled to participate in a context where the goal is not to shame or humiliate, but to address the harm suffered. 
even in situations when no one has been directly harmed. The same context of respect and honesty can help move people towards a new, more hopeful future. And finally, my last suggestion, which is missiological. The church's first task is to develop the processes and character within itself for maintaining what Paul calls the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. But this is not its only task. The church in the present is called to be what the world will be ultimately. The church is thereby not one community among many, but is rather meant to reflect Christ's new humanity. It is, as Paul claims, a totally new creation, by virtue of its being the visible manifestation of Christ's earthly body. Clearly then, there is still much of the world that persists in our church communities and needs to be repented of. This means, however, that the church, church is called to speak out when it witnesses the world acting in rebellion against God's restored creation, as well as joining up with efforts outside the church that clearly manifest the hallmarks of the new age. This is what drew me to Anabaptism, with its ecclesiology as, as a community of witnesses to the life made possible by Jesus, combined with its dedication to witnessing to the way of peace in the world. Here again, I believe restorative justice offers a unique opportunity for the church's witness. Having grown into a social movement, there are now numerous ways in which restorative churches could partner with the restorative movement in helping to realise what we know as the peaceable kingdom, whether in schools, workplaces, the justice system, or in our own neighbourhoods, Christians can witness to their faith as one that does justice and be known as peacemakers. A crucial part of this task is for Christians to be ready to testify to the faith that motivates their life. While working to introduce more restorative interventions in the world is a good thing, from the perspective of faith, it can be just another form of Constantinianism. The danger for the church in any generation is to forget their foundational narrative and to place their faith in whatever has the appearance of progress. Restorative justice, as its early Anabaptist promoters saw, could go in the direction of numerous other reforms and become co-opted by forces alien to its original intentions. The church is vital to the future of the restorative justice vision provided it continues to ground this vision in the justice of God's kingdom made present in the person of Jesus. Now, I began with a, a story from the community where Kat and I first joined uh, Urban Vision. Since those years in the inner city of Wellington, we have helped establish a small Christian community living in high density council housing, as well as in two other suburbs, uh, which have had a history of topping statistics for unemployment, economic degeneration, gang affiliation, and crime. And to be honest, in this context, Kat is the real peacemaker. And so she's, uh, she's gonna come and get, give some examples of, of some of the stories that um, have emerged as we have tried to kind of live life intentionally as God's restorative agents in our neighborhood. So Kat, would you come? And we might have some kind of Q&A to kind of tease out some of these things afterwards if, if people would like. Cool. Kia ora everyone. So my name's Kat. And it was funny um, when Matt Enslow was talking about snakes before because it actually reminded me of something a spiritual director said to me once when we were talking about community ministry. And she said to me, you know, in ministry, Kat, it's not the snakes that will kill you. It's the pecking to, te to death by ducks. <laughs> I thought, isn't that so true? The pecking to death... <laughs> Pecking to death by ducks, that's actually really hard to say. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a little bit about what I'm going to be talking about in a way. Um, yeah, so 
It's really humbling to be speaking to you guys tonight and especially having the Bruderhof amongst us because you guys have been quite influential for Urban Vision in our shaping of um, who we are and feeling as though we exist in a long line of um, ancestors, I suppose, who have been living this life for a very long time. So I really want to honour you guys tonight and it's a real privilege to be speaking in front of you. In fact, the opening line for my talk is that... Um, you know, there's that famous book, Why We Live in Community, by Eberhard Arnold. And sometimes, I must confess, I ask myself, why do we live in community? Because living in community um, can be really hard, especially given, I think, the biggest gift of community, one of the biggest gifts of community, is conflict. <laughs> I truly believe that. And the thing is, is that our culture and ourselves as people. We hate conflict, don't we? And we do whatever we can to avoid conflict. But actually, conflict is a true gift of community, and it's an opportunity um, for reconciliation. But primarily, conflict in community reminds us that we are not God, <laughs> and that we desperately need God. So in our context in Nainai, um, I'm someone who is, yeah, I, I guess a bit of a bridge builder between worlds. We live in a neighbourhood that um, has lots of social housing. There's a lot of violence in our, in our community, a lot of domestic and family violence, and a lot of, um, you know, gang violence and street violence. Um, and so one of the things that happens to me, for whatever reason, is that I get in the middle of violent confrontations. And one night I was... Um, I was actually lying in bed and Tom was in the shower and I heard, I heard arguing brewing and I was lying there, I was thinking, okay, what's happening here? And I kept listening. And so I went to my window and I peered out and I saw that actually there was about three men who were down at the house of a good friend of mine down the road and that, yeah, there was, there was full-on conflict going on. So I left um, the door open so Tom would know I was somewhere and something was going on and I, I actually ran down the road and... It was interesting because I found my neighbours from next door at the house of my very good friend and there were men um, who had their tops off and they were, they were really angry and they were um, screaming and lots of them were doing um, hakas, which is a Māori kind of, um, it's a kind of, kind of war kind of thing and so they were really quite, um, quite worked up and another of my neighbours actually had a baseball bat as well and my friend's son had... Um, actually been walking around the neighbourhood um, trying to break into cars and so my neighbours were, were one of those people and they were, they were furious about it and yeah there's big conflict brewing so I went down there and because I knew both parties I was able to kind of get in the middle of it and, and calmly try and you know bring the, bring the thing down and that happened over time, things seemed to calm down and eventually the police came and it was interesting because I, I got back home and I really, you know, the adrenaline's pumping but the thing I keep thinking is, you know, like, like where is God in this situation? Where, where is God and how can I be witness to God, a witness of Jesus in the midst of this conflict? And so I texted my friend who lived down the road and I said, look, I'm praying for you. And she rang me the following morning and she said, Kat, you know, when you, when you texted me, I really felt this, this peace come upon me and I, I really felt at peace. So I was thinking, oh, that's really cool. It was interesting because recently we went away and when we got home, um, my friend, my neighbour from down the road came over and she said, look, I really need to talk to you. And she said there'd been another violent conflict down at her house where another neighbour had, um, had her son up against the wall and was, was you know, had his hands around her son's neck and she really felt that she needed to calm the conflict down and she just used all these tools that you know we'd talked about in the past and she'd managed to bring that conflict to a halt but she came to me and she was saying you know how do I how do I make peace with them and how do I make sure that my family is safe by actually making sure that we're at peace and she said can you pray for me so we spent about 20 minutes just really praying and you know God was present, the Holy Spirit was present, and she was crying, and we were actually able to pray about all sorts of things in her life that were challenging and feeling really dark at that stage. So that's a really, um, just a concrete example of being a, a peacemaker in, in a place, you know, a bridge builder between, between people, because conflict 
like that destroys communities. And in our neighbourhood, sometimes people get really injured and sometimes they even, you know, they get killed. Um, but for me, you know, it probably sounds funny to some of you, but for me it's easy to be a neighbourhood peacemaker where the conflict is like external to me, you know, and I can kind of get in the middle of it and, and help to sort it out. But it touches me because... You know, I'm compassionate and it it affects me. But ultimately, I'm coming at it from a place of, like, distance because I'm I'm not invested in it. They, They haven't hurt me directly and I've done nothing to hurt them. But for me, I find it really challenging to truly be a peacemaker in my own Urban Vision team, like in our little team community. You know, we have a number of young people in our community and there was a team retreat we had recently and one of them, man, he took... It's like an hour and a half into it, and he's still not there. And then we get the phone call, and he's like, oh, I need someone to pick me up from the train station. And so by the time this young guy turned up at Team Retreat, I was fuming. I was really, really angry. And I made it really clear to him that it was not okay that he was that late, and that our time was just as important as his, and that we really needed to get things going. But ultimately, I was actually just really pissed off. It was funny because the next morning um, when we were about to start, we start with a prayer time and, you know, you could, cut the, you could cut the tension with a knife, like it's still really tense. And this young one, he was, he was really humble and he said, look, before we start, I just really want to apologise to you guys for being so late and I just really want to own the fact that that was really, you know, unfair and really dumb and I just, yeah, I'm really sorry. And for me, obviously, I just felt this instant conviction of like just I needed to apologise. So I then address the whole group myself and I say, look, guys, I also just want to really own that. I was really off and I was really angry and I'm really, I'm really sorry. And, you know, again, just starting our team retreat in that spirit of humility, of owning our humanity and our brokenness was really the thing that set that time together apart And I really felt the presence of God in those moments of just being, you know, just really human and honest. And there's something about seeking truth together and owning our own kind of stuff and and listening for God and being prepared to apologize that that really does build community. We recently had a friend um, who was doing a little review of our Urban Vision team. So he came and met with all the team without us and he was like, you know, what are some really good things about Kat and Tom's leadership? And it was funny because it just came out time and time again that all of them really appreciated that we're always apologising, <laughs> which I think is pretty cool, but does go to show that, you know, I have a lot to apologise for. Tom less so because he's a little less fiery, but for me, yeah, I have a lot to apologise for in, in community life. Yeah, so that's it from me really, but we wanted to just open up a time for anyone who has questions or comments, just feel free to throw them at us. Um, just for a little bit, eh, Matt? Not too long, eh? Uh, I have Mary was just whispering stuff in my ear, so I What were you whispering, Mary? In terms of questions, how long have we got? Questions oh, okay. oh, oh, mate. mate. Just ask, away. ask away. Ask away or comment away, and there's microphones here for people to grab if you like. Yeah, come. Do you want to come up as well, babe? Maybe we could come back. I have a sorry question. I have a question. Um, I was reading John 17 today, and um, and it boggles my mind that Jesus would expect us to be as close to each other as the the Trinity itself. And I'm going, hang on, that's just a bit unrealistic, isn't it? (laughs) But um, so. um, and it also boggles my mind that there's so few efforts seems to be put into getting to that point where we are at a Trinity love level. Um, so any ideas as to why this, no, no one seems to even talk about that passage, let, let alone actually attempt to live that way? Can someone read it for us? My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so the world may know that you have said to me. So, yeah, um, 
reading those verses this morning, every time I read them, I think it, it, we're meant to be doing this, but I don't see anyone, let alone myself, <laughs> attempting. So I'm wondering if anyone's following Christ in, at all. <laughs> I don't know if there's a there's an answer to that, um, but I, I would I would have to say, what is this? <laughs> um, this is an attempt, um, and as poor of an attempt as we may feel like we are, this is the attempt to I think recognise the life to which has already been made real for us. Uh, part of the issue in that in that um, scripture is 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 not a call to um, to a perfection of certain habits. Um, that's not the life to which we're called. The life is to recognise the life that has already been given to us, that we already participate in the divine life by virtue of Christ, and to recognise that as each of us, as brothers and sisters, participates in that life, we are as bound to that life and to each other as, as we ever could be. The re realised is that we don't, we don't recognise that in each other. We don't understand often and, and we don't see very clearly um, but I hope that you know a gathering like this is that's that's the intention just to open our eyes a little bit more definitely for us in urban vision we talk a lot about like you know abiding in the vine and also about belonging to the body of Christ and that each of us um, like each of us as communities as well as individuals actually has a has a part to play in the, in the wider body. So I think not everyone's going to look the same. Like so, not everyone in this room is going to be living an intentional community that looks like Urban Vision or the Bruderhof or anything. Like all of us are called to to different expressions, but all of us are called to a life of following Jesus and yeah, participating in the kingdom. But it does look different, I think. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. I'm Graham. Tom, you said that about um, one of the reasons of our fragmenting society is probably our, our fear of or inability to deal with conflict and all of that. And I've thought about that for a long time. Um, you know, even just in a share house, in families, all of that, let alone when, like what you're doing in the communities. Um, and then you talked about the things that you do, like you're in where there's plenty of violence and stuff and working with people, um, how to calm them down, how to work through it, all of that kind of thing. We could talk for days all about it, but I'd love to know what are some of those types of tools that you're teaching people in the middle of really tough things? We w we've been like hugely influenced by Catholic Worker as well. And um, in the early days of being in the inner city, Tom and I and our team were actually reading stuff written by Catholic worker communities about how, like really practical stuff about how to intervene in violent situations. One of the things um, that we tend to do is send the woman. <laughs> it's kind of counterintuitive uh, and it's not a blanket rule, but in our household, I, I'm the one who go because women just naturally are less threatening in situations of conflict and violence. The other thing that I always do is I go straight to the abuser, so to the person who is inflicting the violence, that's the person who I would go to, and I'd go in, and I would genuinely feel deep empathy and compassion for that person. And I don't know if that's actually like a, a God thing, where God is giving me that empathy, but I genuinely feel true empathy for that person. Uh, in the situation I described earlier, though, I made a mistake because our, our neighbour's brother was one of the topless guys down the road, and he was, he was really, really worked up and angry, and I made the mistake, topless, I, I touched him, and he was just, went, don't you fucking touch me, cat, you know, and I was like, what, he was really angry, so as soon as I touched him, that set him off. Um, so that wasn't the right thing to do, so we don't get it right all the time, and that was in that exact situation um, but genuine, generally yeah I, I go to the side of the person who's inflicting violence I would usually um, touch them I don't know maybe it was because he didn't have a top on that it was just too much or something but yeah I'd usually position physically position myself next to that person often um, when we were in the inner city 
because we knew the guys coming in and out of our homes. Um, and because our church was in our home, usually what one of us would do would jump in the middle of it literally with a cup of something and be like, you want a cup of tea? And just say something really random that snaps that person out of that rage. So sometimes just doing something a little bit ridiculous is enough to stop that adrenaline um, or that you know amygdala response thing from happening. It's enough to kind of snap them out of it. Sometimes just for a second though, but sometimes that is long enough to then be like, are you okay? Like, do you, do you wanna talk? You know, just something that brings the tenor of the situation right down. But you know, it, it just varies by situation. Yeah, it really does. And to be honest, the older I get, the less compassion I feel in a way, especially, um, yeah, like another time at the same neighbours, um, we, we saw a man f- punch a woman to the ground. Um, yeah, and that was, that was really full on. So in that situation, I went, the young woman walked off but then she walked back and she had her baby with her. So at that point I went straight to her and it was all about trying to get her to not go in, back in the house. So yeah, it would depend on the situation, but those are a few maybe helpful tips. So what about the lack of silence, like that conflict? Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, I mean, it is all very situation specific. Um, in restorative justice, um, we often talk about the desk model Um, So in a conversation where someone's starting to get more and more heated, more and more angry, um, they're starting to use language that um, is not helpful in the discussion, Um, we describe what we're seeing. Hey, mate, you've just said that word and that word and that word, and this is how I feel about that, you know? So say how you feel about kind of what the person's saying. So describe it, explain kind of what effect it's having on the group or on the other people. Um, and that's often enough. So in, in a really heated kind of conference, um, I might be able to just say, hey, you just did this and, and this. Can you, can you tell me what's going through your mind at the moment? That's a helpful kind of de-escalation one. If, if describe and explain don't work, specify the kind of action or behavior that is appropriate for the conversation. And if that doesn't work, then we usually um, say consequence. So if you keep talking like this, if you keep abuse, using abusive language, we can't continue with this conversation. So we use that, we use that in restorative uh, conferencing, um, and that's often quite helpful. In a team and situation, like with, with peers that you're living in community with, I think just the most important thing is culture. You know, like creating a culture where the norm is to, to listen, to, to seek to understand, and to seek restoration and reconciliation. But, you know, that takes a long time. But, like, for me and Tom, in Urban Vision, um, we're probably a team that does quite well on that stuff because we're super committed to circle process. We're super committed to, um, to group discernment and consensus as well not all urban vision teams are like that so yeah it kind of in a way it's like um it's it's a gift I think and it's also like um a culture that you that you create and you create it by living it and by doing it but having said that like people find me really aggressive because I'm an aggressive person (laughs) like that's that's how God's made me but I also am really prepared to to apologize and to say I'm really sorry guys for being you know, a bit of a bulldozer. So I think just modelling it, you know, is, is really important. Yeah, and theology as well, like having a theology of, of peacemaking, understanding that, that Jesus' intervention in the world was, yeah, was to bring about peace, yeah, and unity and all good things. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Oh, yeah. I just, um, I really loved your question about John 17 and, and actually what you're talking about, conflict resolution is at the heart of finding that unity. And, and I think anybody who, um, who reads that passage is confronted. I'm confronted every time as well. Um, but 
there is a possibility of being committed together to discovering to the fullest extent we can as broken people what Jesus is actually calling us to in John 17. And actually what you're hearing is, is the answer. In other words, my wife and I are committed as a married couple. Um, that's for life. No divorce, no other options, in quotes. And so we are committed to make it work. Now the most important part of that is that Jesus is in the middle of that relationship. And we can't read John 17 without Jesus understanding that he was there among his disciples and through the Spirit he promised to be there among us. And so it's that, that commitment to work things out. Um, Matthew 18 is, is, I'm sure, something you're familiar with. Um, you can comment on that as well. But in the midst of that is grace and, and, and prayer. So commitment, grace, prayer, and, and what, exactly what they're talking about is that commitment to say I'm sorry. You know, simple words to write on a piece of paper, very hard to say to somebody, um, but very, very important. So I, I really appreciate Just one more comment about prayer, because I think that is really important, is that in Urban Vision we have like rhythms of prayer. For, for many teams, that's a, that's a daily rhythm together. Um, for others with young children, it might look a little bit different. Um, but yeah, like in our team, on a, on a Friday morning, we um, have pyjama prayers, <laughs> where we all sit around the table at our house with our, with our three children, there's usually um, 11 of us around, around the table from a n number of different households and we eat breakfast together and then we use the Anglican prayer book to have um, a little liturgical time and we go around the circle and share um, what we need from God for the day or what we're thankful to God for. So I think prayer is just, yeah, such an important, such an important thing. So thanks for mentioning that. And for our communities, it's, it's at the heart of what we're about yeah, for sure. Cool. Um, I was just wondering about what the, how to balance, I guess, reconciliation within your marriage and family and how that models to the community um, and whether that is something that is difficult or whether that's something that just, I guess, naturally flows out of what, what you guys do and believe. Because um, um, my husband and I were in a community of... 16 people and we were the only married couple so we just found it quite interesting um, actually the effect of living in community really helped us um, because we had like we had Eucharist every day so we knew like by 12 o'clock we had to be like um, friends again um, if we had an argument <laughs> but there was just that sense of like community helping our marriage but then our marriage being modeled to others as well but I was wondering how that's worked with you guys. Yeah, that's really cool. On a good day, it's great. On a bad day, yeah, like our team members are rolling their eyes as I'm being a total cow to Tom. Eh? <laughs> I often get looks from my team members when I'm being like really bossy or really just unreasonable. Um, but the other thing is like both me and Tom are really angry people. <laughs> like in terms of the Enneagram, he's at number one, I'm an eight, so we're gut anger people and um, you know that's actually really humbling living in community too because unfortunately you know I get really annoyed with my children yeah really annoyed and um, yeah that is quite humbling but I think you know again it is really just so fabulous for our family too like our kids are so funny like Tess is like oh are they joining our team and then we're talking to Tess and we're like um what's Urban Vision? She's like, ah, we have heaps of parties and we go to lots of weddings. You know, she's missed all of the kind of poor stuff and she's all about the party, which is really, you know, I love that. And we had um, new team, a new team member joining and she's like, oh, what skit are we going to do for our UV hui? You know, like it's all about the skits and the party and the fun times. So, yeah, I think on a good day, living in community as a family is so fabulous and on a bad day I reckon it's still better than not living in community but it's hard but it's still better I reckon. <laughs> um, yeah that's, that's totally right I mean the, the only other thing 
that people tell us at least about our relationship is they actually appreciate the fact that we're willing to disagree with each other in front of other people, um, which we tend to do. Um, and there's a sense in which they can see that um, disagreements don't, doesn't threaten the relationship. Um, we, you can disagree. Um, it doesn't, because at heart, the same kind of core part of our relationship is there. Uh, and people appreciate seeing that. Just to understand kind of in our context, um, we're, we're some of the oldest in our community. Uh, so most of us, most of our members are young, um, often university students and the like who join us. Um, and for them, many of them have not kind of had kids yeah. that they've kind of um, had to look after and spend a lot of time with. So it's a real education for them to be around young kids, um, to see a kind of young married couple other than their own parents. Um, so we feel like it is a huge gift to them. Um, we grow good dads in Urban Vision. Like Tom, you know, before we were even married, had lived with a couple who were about to have a baby, and they, you know, he lived with them when they had the baby, and is around a newborn baby. You know, it's all just normal stuff that back in the day all of us would have been exposed to, but somehow in our culture and society, it's changed. You know, and these young guys particularly may never have even held a baby, let alone know what to do when one arrives. And so, yeah, we I reckon we grow pretty characterful, mature guys in Urban Vision and that's pretty cool. Um, yeah and when Tom says we're the oldest in our community he's talking about in our team we're the oldest. Um, so in our neighbourhood of Nainai there's two Urban Vision teams. The other team has you know a guy in his 60s and his wife who's nearly 60 and then another couple in their in their 50s with, with four kids two of whom have left home. So yeah there's a big range in Urban Vision of ages and stages um, which also has its strengths and challenges too. But yeah, I reckon it's really, really profound for young people to see family in action and to demystify what it, what it is and what it looks like, you know? Um, it's not this magic thing that happens, you get married and all of a sudden, you know, you complete me <laughs> and you feel really great. You know, our young people know it's not like that. Actually, it's just really hard at times, but also just it's part of the community. So yeah. Thank you. Inspirational. Um, not the kind of conflict that I often find myself in though, so my, my question is, um, you're obviously committed Christians, living amongst people who are not that way. Uh, are there any, any times where because of the way you want to and have to follow the Bible, right, in the way you behave, you've just been talking about your marriage, that you cause conflict, right? that you have to make a stand, and then that is a source of conflict with the people around you? It's a very challenging question. I can't, to be honest, I really can't think of anything off the top of my head. Yeah, I wouldn't say um, it's caused conflict. Um, it's provoked questions. Yeah. Um, so, for instance, um, on our street at least, with, with many of the other families um, who um, uh, lots of the parents have a pretty free relationship to alcohol um, that doesn't seem to end on a night, um, and they do that in front of the kids. Um, and uh, in other areas where uh, kids are allowed to just watch anything on TV for endless hours, um, in all those kind of small and, and sometimes big ways, um, we practice quite a different family life um, to them. Um, and, and they know that it's because we're Christians. Yeah, we're the Christian family on our street. Um, but it hasn't caused conflict. Um, they are kind of intrigued by it. Because, um, I, I, you know, to be honest, for most of our families, they just haven't imagined a different way of being. This is just how they were brought up and this is how they live. Um, so in some ways we're, we're quite different um, and they really appreciate that um, and, and it makes them ask questions of why do they live the way they live. Um, so yeah, to date hasn't caused the conflict um, yeah, that I can think of.
It causes conflict for us because it's like our kids, you know, who are hanging out at their house. So it's more that way. So there definitely is conflict there, but it's not active conflict where they are reacting against us. But it's more like for me, the sense of, oh, you know, should Tess be going down there? And, and, and you know, I have to really talk it through with, with my daughter. Like, I don't want you in front of the screen you're not allowed to be in front of the screen with that 12-year-old girl because, you know, a 12-year-old girl's interest on a screen is, you know, not going to be appropriate for you. Um, and, you know, sometimes she comes home and she says, oh, we, we were listening to music. And I was like, oh, yeah, were you, were you watching the music videos? No, 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 she, she was watching them, but I wasn't, you know? And, and I feel conflict in my, in my guts about that, like, because that, you know, as a parent who wants to protect my daughter against early sexualization and all that yuck stuff in our culture and society, it, it is quite scary. So that's where the conflict is for us. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Thanks so much for sharing with us, guys. Really inspirational stuff. Um, it's hard enough to live in community, let alone live in community in... Um, on the margins, and so I'm interested to hear what are um, the things, the practices that sustain you both and sustain you guys as a community, yeah. I actually reckon it's easier to live in community on the margins. That's the first thing to say. I, I genuinely believe that. There is a gift that happens when you relocate to a marginalised neighbourhood, to a, to a place of poverty, there's something that happens that makes it easier to hold together. I think one of the reasons for that is because community for its own kind of existence or purpose will, will inevitably self-destruct because we don't actually get our needs met in community like just like that. Um, there needs to be an outward thrust, you know, like the gospel thrust bit of, of going out towards the stranger and the other that actually really sustains community life. And the times of deepest intimacy and connectedness in community happens when we're most engaged in, in ministry and, and connection with the margins. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of theological reasons for that, um, but I just totally think that's true. But it is hard over the long haul in terms of, you know, sustaining family life and that. Like, there's challenges to it too, but I actually think it's easier as a small community. Um, but some of our practices include um, daily rhythm of prayer. I don't, I don't have a daily corporate rhythm of prayer, I must confess as I say that, but our communities do. <laughs> Tom probably does. Um, I'm just trying to be honest because I'm not, you know. Um, but daily rhythm of prayer. We have um, team rhythms of life together. So we meet together as a team um, once a week. We eat together. And then we have a time of, um, of deep communion, I suppose, with each other. We are, we're, we're worshipping. Like, we're praising and worshipping. Like, we're singing to God. We're reading the Bible. We're talking together, usually around a theme. In Urban Mission, we, we live by a covenant. So we, we have this covenant. We have this understanding that, that we enter into a covenant with God that involves a commitment to growing in deeper intimacy with Jesus. It involves a commitment to doing life together as a team and in a community. And we have a commitment to giving our best for the least. We have a commitment to justice making in a hurting world. So those are the three things. Growing in intimacy with Jesus, doing life together in our Urban Vision community, and then justice making in a hurting world, giving our best for the least. So within that covenant, there's a whole bunch of spiritual practices. Some of us have spiritual director. Um, we have a long siding where an, an older person in Urban Vision who's been a, around a long time will, will meet with you once a month to talk about some of the challenges of being in community. Some, you know, like, oh, so who's really driving you nuts in your team at the moment? You know, what's that about and how are you responding to that? And so what is your, what is your best for the least look like? You know, what are you doing to engage with your neighbours? Because it's one thing to move into a council flat, but you can live in a council flat and not engage with anyone, you know. So, so how are you engaging with your neighbourhood and, and what are you doing, you know? And also, this is for some people the hardest question, but, you know, what does your prayer life look like? You know, what does your relationship with Jesus look like? 
how, how are you experiencing intimacy with, with God and with Jesus in your life right now? So, yeah, we do have a number of um, practices that sustain us in our life together, yeah. And do you know what? Pretty much every intentional community does. And so I reckon if you're, if you're starting out or even if you've been doing it a long time, like just gleaning the wisdom of a range of different communities is really helpful because it's probably just some good rules of life for everyone, whether you live in an intentional community or not. And there's other people here who will talk about it all weekend, I'm sure. I mean, what, one of the things that um, comes to mind for me is, is to be mindful of where our life is being stretched. Um, so to sustain in, in any one place um, requires um, uh, being thoughtful about the, the other demands on our life um, and to constantly discern how one makes decisions about those other things. So I'm thinking particularly around work um, and where you choose to live, um, how you choose to spend your time, uh, your money. It's, it's those kinds of decisions that I think um, inevitably pull people away from community. Uh, that's well, at least what we have seen. Um, so those who are disciplined in their decisions about life, disciplined about their time, um, and willing to actually give up some things for the sake of being with others, um, those are the people who, who sustain community life. Um, those who think that it comes by just no work, no sacrifice, generally don't hang around. Yeah. I think like the challenge for us in our stage of life, so for me, I've been in Urban Vision for like, this is 18 years now. So I joined as an 18 year old and I do really like even talking to you guys is a challenge to me because I feel like when you've been in it for a while, like you can just kind of ride the culture. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like um, it's just, it becomes your normal. Like it is just our normal. And so it's easy just to, ride the culture and I think um, coming to places where we have to talk about who we are is really challenging because it's like oh yeah we do need to be more committed to to a prayerful life and oh yeah we do need to be more mindful about how we're spending our money and you know all of those challenges just come to mind eh? so it's really yeah it's really quite helpful so thanks for being our sounding board <laughs> should we leave it there